Around December, my manager Avi got a phone call from one of the senior VPs in AT&T, and he asked us to ramp up about three uh, OpenStack development teams by the end of March. So what did we do here in AT&T? So first of all, my name is Shimon, and I hope you had a good lunch and not so tired. And uh, here is Mesh from uh, Cisco, who will follow up with me. Uh, and at least in the next 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about how we in AT&T uh, picked up this challenge of creating three development OpenStack teams and also I'm going to show you how you can uh, contribute code to OpenStack because I think this is one of the most important things we can do here and let's go okay so a few words about at and because they still pay my salary so we're quite a big company number 12 uh, in the fortune 500 uh, we have a large network about 114 petabytes daily today and uh, by 2020 we expect this to multiply tenfold so it's kind of big uh, in Tel Aviv, we have a presence of 500 people. You can probably see them here in the <laughs> sitting here in the chairs. <laughs> um, some people are working, but most of us are here. And uh, of course, we're uh, looking for more. So if there are five, six people not at and in the company in this uh, hall, give me a call later on. Uh, about at and and OpenStack. Uh, we have a high, uh, if you heard before Giddy's uh, talk about uh, a couple of hours ago, uh, we are planning to move 75% of our network by 2020 to the cloud, to, vir to virtualization, and OpenStack there is going to be a backbone. Okay. And uh, in uh, the last Austin <laughs> uh, event, uh, we had a high presence. We won a super user award. Uh, we're a platinum member uh, in OpenStack, one of eight platinum members. And... Uh, Okay, uh, we have th about 35 Scrum teams working on contributing code to OpenStack, uh, seven Scrum teams in Tel Aviv, so we're kind of big also here locally. Okay, so going back to the previous slides about what we did. So first of all, I don't know, whoever is uh, working on trying to uh, find people to work OpenStack, there are not so many people wo uh, walking around us, so we had to start with by uh, hiring people, okay, about uh, 20, 25 software engineers, and we gave them Python training, mainly online. Uh, started playing around coding games a bit in Python, so we have uh, some more experience in Python. And we started our OpenStack uh, training. So at the beginning, we used uh, uh, Linux Academy for uh, online training, and we started playing around with uh, the documentation and reading. And we followed that with uh, the cookie, cut cookie Cutter project. Now, the Cookie Cutter project, if uh, whoever knows about it, it gives us a lot of basic tools for working with OpenStack, for developing OpenStack. Uh, the whole Oslo package, Oslo log, Oslo documentation, the databases, uh, Pecan, Keystone, inter Keystone integration. So once you get familiar with the Cookie Cutter project, uh, you can feel a lot more at home, a lot about talks also. Uh, and we also reverse engineered a bit the Cinemeter project uh, for to understand how an OpenStack project is built. Um, what I want to discuss with you in the next 10 minutes is how to contribute to OpenStack. Now, when I say contribute, so usually the first, first thought that comes to mind is, okay, I need to go and add a feature to Nova, but that's not really contributing. It is, it's a very big contribution, but you can start small. Uh, what I recommend is, First of all, join in the join the community. Okay, listen in on talks, on conversations, and when you feel a bit more comfortable, you can actually answer a question. Okay, and that's contribution. Okay, someone doesn't know how to help you. We're a community. Answer, and you're contributing. Uh, another way to contribute is by reviewing code. There's so many pushes. We've seen a lot of talks before about how much code is in uh, the Garrett and in uh, OpenStack community, and people need to review it. Not only the core reviewers, but also us as a community. So once you're reviewing somebody's push. Okay, you've made a contribution. Now, when we get, uh, when you feel a bit more comfortable, you can actually start uh, patching a bug, suggesting blueprints. Okay, contributing in a more large scale than uh, reviewing. Okay, join the community. So, uh, some technical things you need to join the community. Uh, you have the sign in to the L OpenStack Foundation and Launchpad for Garrett, and you add your SSH key and you sign their license agreement and. Uh, slide is, these slides are available, whoever wants afterwards, and just follow through, it's quite simple. And communication. So I mentioned before communication. So there are three ways, popular ways of communication. The first is the mailing list. You get an email once or twice a day telling you about your projects that you're interested in. Like you can get joined the Nova mailing list, the Cinder mailing, mailing list on every other project. And you can communicate two ways to communicate. The first one is the ask.openstack.org. You can ask questions there and people will answer and the IRC for also for chat room for discussing projects. 
Um, I have here a slide, and I've heard a few talks about the life cycle, so I don't want to repeat too many of things that we already heard today, but generally, once you register, okay, the code sits in uh, Git, okay, on Garrett, which is the reviewing system on top of Git, and the idea behind Garrett is that us as a community, people push the code, and in Garrett, we need to go and review. Now, whenever someone makes a review, it adds to the push a plus one or a minus one, according to the review of the person, and what happens is that Every project has core reviewers, and these core reviewers, they're quite busy people, I don't know. And when you make a push to Nova, it takes a while for them to come and to say, okay, let's merge this code into the main code base. So when people from the community review the code and give their comments, and assuming that it's a good push, when, you want to when the core people want to review the push and they see that us as a community have given a plus one saying, okay, this is good, so it's much easier for them to merge it. Now, on top of Garrett, we have uh, the Jenkins, okay, which is the automatic uh, build and runs the automation testing on the projects. And at the end, also Jenkins will give you a plus one. So every time we push the code, Jenkins will run the automated tests and give us uh, its uh, plus one or minus one in case we fail with the automatic tests. So what I'd like to do here is uh, make a change. And uh, are we good with uh, uh, our repository actually kind of crashed five minutes ago, so it's quite a funny. and. If we click on this link, okay, we'll reach uh, for the Nova project, low-hanging fruits. Now, low-hanging fruit is a good place to start when we want to contribute because it's defects that are not critical. For example, we have here some misspelled words in Nova. Okay, someone misspelled the sentence here, but uh, if you click on the some misspelled word in project uh, Nova, we can see here that someone donated code and they misspelled the word extensions or evacuate or legacy. And the easiest thing here is, okay, go to Nova and open the code and <laughs> correct the typos. Um, now, the way to do it, is first of all, is first of all, we need to start by cloning the repository. Uh, are we, do we have a cloned repository errors? We have 78% of a cloned repository. So I'm not sure we'll be able to uh, <laughs> complete the clone of the repository because the network here is causing us problems. But the idea here is we clone the repository, uh, we make our fix. Now. It's like a regular Git project. Okay, we make a fix. We push it back to Garrett to get a review. Uh, before we do that, we need to pass the uh, unit tests of Tox. So a few words about Tox, and I don't want to delve into it too much. Uh, Tox is the framework, Python framework, excuse me, for uh, unit testing. And Nova has around 1,000 unit tests, and obviously when we push code, add code to our repository, we need to add unit tests, and we need to make sure all our unit tests run, and it takes, I don't know, it could take uh, five, 10 minutes just for the unit testing of, talk of uh, Nova to run. So I think it's an interesting uh, topic for maybe next year for talk to me about talks, and uh, maybe I'll suggest it here also. Uh, and then we push the code back to, to uh, back to Garrett, and once the code is in Garrett, again, call to the community, review the code, give it a plus one, Jenkins will run automation, and also send an email to us, okay, your code is good, you get a plus one, and what we'll be waiting for is for the, for the core reviewers of the projects to come and say, okay, this is good, uh, your code will be merged into so-and-so version, and uh, you're done with the contribution. Um, it's a short uh, call, it's about 15 minutes, and Namesh will be joining, uh, taking, picking up uh, the Slack from here. Um, what I want to do is I want to call you to contribute, okay? Come make, really, a code review, that's all. If everyone gives one single code review to a push, we'll a community, especially in Israel, where I have to say we're not the biggest uh, founders of contributing. We usually like just to, to take and not to give back. So we should take, okay? Especially a company like AT&T is giving, which is not the easiest, uh, most straightforward thing for AT&T to give back to the community. So I'm calling everyone else, come contribute back to the community, make a push, register to the OpenStack, and that's it. So uh, Mesh will uh, come now and discuss his uh, point of view as an uh, operator, his frustrations as being an operator in the community. And uh, that's it. Uh, just if we have questions afterwards, both of us will be here and we'll join again. There'll be a Q&A after, towards the end of the session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, Shimon. Um, my name is Mesh. Um, I work at Cisco, um, as you can see on the shirt. Um, of course, I don't know if I really need to introduce Cisco very much because most people are already using their network components all over the world. A global company, and of course, what many people do not perhaps know is that Cisco is a 
significant contributor into OpenStack itself, not only from the network perspective, but on from all fr across all projects. And there are two PTLs currently, which are Cisco employees. One of them is for Magnum, and I can unfortunately for the life of me not remember what the other one is, but <laughs> um, contribute code into Sonometer, into the network components, into a Horizon, and so on and so forth, heat to heat as well. Um, my name is Mesh. You can find me on Twitter. I'm blasting away for over here for the conference. I'm a cloud platform architect working for this service provider video uh, organization within which is located in Jerusalem in Israel. Uh, I'm also an author. I wrote two books, one of them on VMware uh, uh, architecture design and the second one on OpenStack architecture design. And I've been playing around with OpenStack since more or less Havana. Um, the talk. So Shimon presented one aspect of contributing to OpenStack, and I would like to present the, what I perceive as the not so nice aspect of contributing to OpenStack, which hopefully we'll be able to change in the not too late, uh, far future. Um, OpenStack is um, comprised of a number of um, communities, or I would say segments. First one is what they call the active technical contributors. And if you had committed code, as Shimon suggested before, you would be considered an active, contri an active te technical contributor. That means that somebody that makes a commit to any of the OpenStack repositories is somebody which is considered a contributor to OpenStack. The other part is there is what is called a user committee. A user committee is another part of the OpenStack governance um, mechanism, or as it is. Um, these are the users and operators of, op of OpenStack, people which are actually using the uh, UI or the end users which are actually accessing what we are all contributing, and of course the people which are maintaining and operating these systems on a day-to-day -day basis. The last part, of course, is the foundation, the third leg of the triangle, which is the more, uh, I would say, commercial side and overall um, um, insight or holistic view of what OpenStack is. Um, these are more, as I would say, the three different pieces of the governance board or the governance body of OpenStack. So why frustrated as I stood on, on, my, um, on, my, on the title of my slide? Um, frustrated because there is something which is fundamentally broken in the way that, we have, uh, that open, the OpenStack community today actually operates. Number one and one of the biggest things is the feedback loop is completely and totally broken. People which are um, trying to get feedback from an operator perspective in back into OpenStack have ex significant trouble for a number of reasons. For number one is um, it's the tools that are um, used in OpenStack today are not what somebody that maintains a data center 24-7 is used to using. They don't know how to use um, um, Launchpad, not necessarily, and if they do, the amount of information until somebody can actually get a bug pointed or when then that bug is going to be addressed or just put in a piece of feedback that the UI doesn't look nice is not a very simple way of wanting to get that, back, that feedback into OpenStack at all. There's nobody you can say, okay, I want to send a feedback at openstack.org and somebody will answer your email. That doesn't exist. There's very specific ways of which the OpenStack community works. And if you don't know those ways, then you're more or less left out. Um, I'm a very nice practitioner of DevOps, and there's three very nice gentlemen in the back over there on my team, which are also very, very much involved as well in DevOps in the organization in Israel. And um, I personally perceive that there is a very, very clear disconnect between the developer part of OpenStack, the people which are writing the code, and the operational perspective. Because people are writing code, developing things without actually, firstly, going to get the requirements of what people are going to do with the product, but they're still writing code because that's something which is nice. For example, um, a perfect um, example for me was the fact when somebody wrote the, at the beginning the first version of load balancing as a service. It was a very nice thing, it worked very well, but absolutely not one single customer or anybody will use that in production if they want their job. Because the thing is not highly available, it crashes the whole time, it's made as a specific way the way it was built, it was not for production use, and was always never tagged as that, but why do people in the OpenStack community continue to contribute and develop this thing over a number of years and a number of cycles if nobody's ever going to use it in the end. Of course, this led to another version, which is the load balancer version 2, and things are being improved, but still, these things could have been avoided if somebody had gone to people which are actually using and operating OpenStack and asked, what do you actually need? What do you actually use? So it's a very, very, very big disconnect between the developers and the operations. 
Influence is everything. And my um, thought is that the influence is not something which the operators at the moment have. There are people within OpenStack that do have influence. As we said, the foundation, which is uh, partially people which are, because they are putting money into OpenStack and they are considered board members because of their contributions. There are people which are elected, like Tim in the back, who was elected by the community as well. They have the influence on the commercial aspect of OpenStack, but only the commercial. I would say they're not very much into the technical part. <coughs> there is a project team lead, the PTL, if you've ever heard that, if that term before. Of um, These are the people which are elected by the community or the specific communities in order to lead the direction of that project. If it will be Neutron, Nova, and so on and so forth. And there's a technical committee where they have the overall technical leadership for all of OpenStack. For everything technical in OpenStack, all the projects, everything is run in OpenStack and the technical, in the technical parts. <coughs> so how do operators contribute today? Firstly, where do the operators fall into this category? Officially, according to OpenStack, the operators and users are not part of the technical community. They're part, as we said, of the user committee. OpenStack operators today um, contribute within a number of ways. For example, um, there's all kinds of repositories which are called ops repositories, which provide tools for the community, such as logging um, filters, um, Kibana queries, Ansible, um, What's the word? Ansible scripts, recipes? Playbooks. playbooks, sorry, thank you. Ansible playbooks for how to deploy OpenStack. A number of things that operational people are interested in, and these are the things which are committed into the OpenStack repositories. Um, there's also working groups. A working group is something which is also un falls under the user committee, which is a group of people which are interested in trying to um, promote some kind of um, topic or some kind of direction within OpenStack. And there are a number of working groups currently there, for example, an enterprise working group, a scientific working group, um, user stories, product management, and so on and so forth. And there's a number of working groups which currently meet on a regular basis on the IRC channels and have meetings and meetups and so on and so forth. The last one which I wanted to mention was a, a, an initiative which was started by the um, operations community. They wanted to put tags S OpenStack moved approximately a year and a half ago away from um, the defined release to a tagged release. And all these tags were supposed to say something about OpenStack. So one of the things which wanted to do was started was the fact of these tags to say, is this project documented correctly? Does it have a high availability option in order for you to install it? This thing is moving very, very slowly because, um, honestly, I don't know why, because things which should actually move quicker, but there's not enough people contributing to it. So if you would like to, there's an opportunity as well. Um, <coughs> all of that work before. No, none of it constitutes as a contribution to OpenStack at all. It's not recognized by the OpenStack community at all. <sighs> Who was it that had the slide? Why does it matter? I think it was Jesse that had um, used the same text. But why does it matter that operational people are involved in OpenStack? It does, because the operational people are the one which feel the pain day to day of things not working properly. If your network is not working correctly, if your solometer keeps on exploding because Mongo doesn't know how to handle the database correctly, and so on and so forth, so forth. When people are introducing new technologies with new database dependencies, which not have not been tested correctly and do not, have, do not have a high available solution, are introduced into OpenStack, these are the people which are going to have to be running the cloud making sure it doesn't fall over on its face every day, and helping you keep things running. And the one thing which I like to say is community contribution is not only contributing code. All the things which we've said before, people which present at events like this, people which organize events like this, these are people which are also contributing to the community and should be recognized as such. Um, how long do I have? No, for you. We'll get there. Okay, sorry. Um, the technical committee has elections. As we said, we talked about the technical commission, that ha technical committee that has the technical direction and leadership of overall OpenStack, has elections twice a year. Any foundation member, which means anybody that has signed up as a member of the OpenStack organization, can vote. The only people that can actually, sorry, the only people that are allowed to vote for these um, people 
for the committee, which is six, six or seven people once every six months, depends on the, the, the cycle, are people which are ATCs, and ATCs, as we said, is people that contribute code. And to take Shimon's example from before, if you put in a Git review or a change a piece of code which has a spelling mistake commit, and you fix up somebody made a typo in OpenStack code, you are eligible to vote for the OpenStack technical committee. Everybody else that has not done that is not allowed. Even if you are, for example, I personally have run for the OpenStack technical committee once, a number of other people from the operations committee, uh, operations um, part of OpenStack have also run, but nobody has ever been elected, only from the developer community as well. The funny thing is I'm allowed to run as part of the technical committee, but I'm not allowed to vote for myself because I have not committed a typo error into OpenStack code. OpenStack is built on um, four opens. The first one is OpenStack is built on open source. The second one is built on open design. The third is open development. This is all on the OpenStack governance site. I'm just going to flick through it quickly, but I want to get to the last one. The last one is OpenStack community, and this is part of the OpenStack charter. The technical governance of the project is a community meritocracy with contributors electing technical leads and members of the technical committee. The biggest question, which unfortunately today is not clear, what is a contributor? Which is something which I think should be changed. Where are we going in the future? Um, we talked about working groups before, and um, one of the working groups which have started, and it's called, it was once upon a time called non-ATC recognition, it's now called AUC, which stands for Active User Contributor, it has started to find a way to recognize the people who are contributing to OpenStack, but not contributing code, be it people who write articles on the OpenStack blogs, if it's people which are part of the Super User TV um, interviews which are held at conferences and all other events, people which contribute to meetups such as this kind of a thing, people which organize user groups and so on and so forth, people which are moderators at different kind of events, people which are track chairs which start going through all the sifting through the 1500 different kinds of people which are uh, submitting presentations for the OpenStack uh, summits. These are people which are, again, contributing to the community, but they are not recognized. So, how I would like to see this in the future is number one, the oper operations contributions should be completely fully recognized and they should also be able to, as we said, as a contributor, vote for the, acti the ATC as well, for the technical committee. The same way that a user contribution also should be fully recognized and also eligible to vote as part of the community for the ATC as well. Um, anybody remember, know what this is? I have a dream. Thank you very much, Sean. I have a dream. Martin Luther King sat in the middle of Washington with a decent amount of people. I have a dream. I wrote a blog post, a very lengthy blog post, about this whole, this whole situation. You're more than welcome to read, um, voice your opinion, shout at me, agree with me, whatever you would prefer. Um, but this is a, a dream that I have, hopefully, that one day all, as I think the thing, the thing is we are all OpenStack, but we are not all really OpenStack, because our OpenStack is divided into two different parts today. Um, Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, either for Shimon or myself, please feel free. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, are you familiar with the extra ATC? The extra ATC, yes. Yes. Like anyone can propose anyone to be an extra ATC, and that applies to the as well. So that would give you the ability to actually propose. Agreed. So, so why don't you promise to have first minute temperature out no, that we don't have a way to actually measure who's contributed and using comments and you know measures and whatever, it's just easier because you can uh, find that. And that's one of the problems we have. and that's part of why we also introduce the whole extra ATC stuff so that people translate in all this time, us and everyone else can actually come in and say, like, oh, I've contributed so much from you know some trusted source, you know, puts your name in there and that gives you again both the right to the Love you for sure, definitely. There is the extra ADC, which is an option that anybody in open, st anybody in the world can approach. Either somebody, one of the PTLs or one of the technical committee, and say, "I have contributed. Can I please have the specific ATC status?" And if it's a cost approved, you will be able to, as we say, as a full-fledged community contributor to OpenStack. 
which is why, I, I don't know if you missed the, fir the first part, was the fact that now the whole work of the AUC, which is an active user contributor, is starting to come up, which we will start be able to quantify those measurements which everybody's been looking for. If people are active in, um, in working groups, if they're active in meetups like this by organization and so on and so forth, those things can also be considered part of the, act of the OpenStack community. Jeremy's jumping up and down in the back. I'm going to 20 seconds. I answer the question. The question was, <coughs> okay. The question was, what is the hardest part for, um, as you say, for contributing code? Is the fact that not everybody, in general, number one is the process of getting set up through all the hoops. In other words, signing up to the the foundation, getting a Garrett key, getting an SSH key, getting review into Garrett. Uh, uh, Ubuntu one account, whatever it may be, these things are hoops which make things sh hopefully should be a lot easier. And the second thing is people would like to contribute by just saying, I have a problem. And usually the, what my feeling and ex past experience was that people don't say, you have a problem, okay, so fix it yourself or provide the code to fix it and we'll take care of it. No, okay. Thank you. Thank you.